what punishment or sanction is required, but ultimately does not necessarily change behaviour. A chief data officer will soon be appointed who will lead and manage all data governance issues. Their role will focus on improving data quality, putting in place the supports to create a culture uh, where data is valued. Additional personnel will be appointed to support this function. This important post will be filled before the end of quarter one, 2018. A number of data quality initiatives will be progressed in 2018 as outlined in the National Policing Plan. This includes the centralization of responsibilities for instant reclassification at JISC and the updating of IT systems to enhance data quality. <coughs> Under the proposed new divisional model of policing, a position of superintendent, governance, performance and professional standards will be introduced to ensure compliance across the organization. The recent introduction of individual and team performance management, PALF, reviews to the Garda organization for all Garda personnel is seen as a crucial step forward in developing an accountability culture throughout the entire organization. Each individual uh, performance plan for 2018 will include a data quality goal for all staff. In support of enhancing frontline supervision, 250 sergeant and 50 inspector vacancies will be filled by means of a competition uh, to be held in quarter one of 2018. The majority of promoted personnel will be allocated to uniform supervision. Further supervisors will be provided through reallocation upon the civilianization of administrative roles throughout 2018. The Executive Director of HRPD will examine our supervisor allocation model and report his findings to the Policing Authority by the second quarter of 2018 to ensure a strategic approach is taken to supervisor allocation. A learning and development strategy for the wider organization is at an advanced stage and should be ready for publication in early 2018. This is key to ensuring that our personnel are supported in providing services to a high standard. The above developments will be supported by the progress of the Garda Modernization and Renewal Program. Supporting projects, among other things, include roster and duty management, mobility and corporate communications projects, as well as the initiatives mentioned above. Considerable reform has already taken place with regard to how we engage in traffic policing, and much of the systems and policy issues which caused the failures referenced above have already been addressed. Our approach to roads policing will be fundamentally reformed in 2018. We have commenced a significant restructuring of roads policing in Garda Sihana and will be addressing each specific issue related to the Crow Howarth report. The role of Assistant Commissioner Roads Policing now includes responsibility for governance and performance for roads policing. The role will also include responsibility for roads policing data provision until the new Chief Data Officer is appointed. Divisional traffic units will expand in 2018 and become Divisional Roads Policing Units. They will have increased responsibility for road safety education, crime prevention and crime operations crime interdiction targeting of the road network. Resources attached to roads policing will be increased by 10% before the end of 2017 and by a further 10% in 2018, a total of 150 Gardaí. The allocation of additional resources will include a proportionate number of frontline supervisors. Training will be provided for all new and existing roads policing personnel. A business case for 30 full-time divisional roads policing inspectors who will take responsibility for operations, management and governance of roads policing personnel is being prepared. Policies on fixed charge notices and mandatory intoxicant testing checkpoint pro processes have been updated to address the related issues in the Crow Howarth report. Governance structures have been put in place to support local managers and personnel in ensuring no repetition of the issues outlined above. Compliance will be overseen at the National Roads Policing Bureau and will also be measured at performance and accountability framework meetings. A project team has been established to progress the recommendations of the Crawworth Report under the direction of a project board chaired by Deputy Commissioner of Policing and Security. I will act as project sponsor, providing oversight of progress. Monthly reports will be made to the, uh, to the policing authority. To conclude, Chair, I fully acknowledge that the failures found in the Crawworth are wide-ranging wide across all levels of the organisation. Garda Senior Management has met with the Garda Associations in recent weeks, and collectively we have agreed to ensure that all the recommendations of the Crawworth report are implemented. <coughs> collectively, we have agreed to work constructively together to ensure such failures cannot happen again. The confidence and support we have enjoyed from the Irish people that has been earned over generations has been damaged. It is now up to all of us in Angarda Sheikhana 
to win back that trust by providing a professional, honest and ethical service to the communities we serve. And in concluding, I'd just like again to repeat uh, our apology with regard to uh, the failures that have been identified in both of those reports. Grimagui. Gary Margaret, Commissioner. Um, just for the information of the meeting um, we have just received this afternoon, your formal response in the form of a report. The authority will obviously read, read that report and consider it, and no doubt we will have ongoing engagement, uh, including the engagement you described here around uh, the monthly reports and so on and so forth. So we'll, 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 we'll consider it um, when we meet next. But by way of, obviously my colleagues have questions for the Commissioner, and I'm going to invite my colleague Maureen Lina to begin the questions. Maureen. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, Commissioner, um, the tone of your statement and the content, it's obvious you take it very seriously, and that'll be important to communicate to your force. And I, I don't think there's any doubt about your commitment, but I do think that Part of your statement reflects a benign perspective that others may not agree with. Um, the statement says that individual members were not benefiting from recording practices, that it was a sloppy, lazy, and unprofessional approach made worse by a lack of appreciation of the value of data, and this was central to the organization's failure. And all that is true, but in fact, it was much more severe than that and deep. False recording was tolerated over many years until last year. So it's very recent history. And Crow Howarth reports that it was supported and encouraged in some instances by superior officers. So it's not, ju not just about being lazy and sloppy. It was deliberate falsification, not in all instances, but in many instances. And some benefit accrued might not have been financial, might have been to look good, might have been to enhance someone's promotion, chances, but there was some reason it was done. If nothing else, it's a severe management failure, as you acknowledge, and it represents very, very poor management performance and an absence of accountability, and one has to assume that it's more widespread than breath tests and the counting of breath tests. So I'd like your comment on that in the first instance, please. Uh, yes, uh, well, I fully accept and have from the beginning uh, the findings of uh, cohort which places blame at all levels of the organization, from governance to management to supervision and then to the frontline decisions by individuals. All of those together mean that uh, we have all been found wanting. Uh, and that requires me as commissioner to ensure that we're all involved in the solution. And in looking at that and in calling out the areas that you just did uh, with regard to, uh, you know, people possibly looking good because of certain uh, things happening, uh, you know, the way we hope to achieve full accountability in that regard from now on is to ensure that we get our performance management system in place as soon as possible. We have finished our training of the management cadre of the organization in that regard, and we will be rolling that out as soon as possible with a specific in, uh, emphasis on data quality in the, in the, uh, for the next 12 months, and longer if that's required. This is something that will take a while, and I, I accept the point you make that it was not confined to breath tests. And that is something that I have to be fully cognizant of as I uh, you know, start to look at the solutions and the resolution of the incident, is to, to be aware uh, that that malaise may have gone a bit deeper or wider. Uh, and in order to ensure that we you know, address that and ensure that people are made fully aware of their individual responsibility uh, in that context, it, it will involve us talking one-to-one, -one, and that means everyone from my office down to the front line and the newest person coming from Templemore, so that any bad practice that has developed and that is seen as normalized uh, at, at, some, uh, at some front line uh, situation, or even in, at, at management, but especially for the young recruits coming out, 
that they will see that there is a new drumbeat there and that, that we're going to set that drumbeat very loudly uh, so that the ethical approach to their day's work is something that they're going to have at the very forefront of the way they do their work. So um, I sense um, over the past uh, few months, uh, since uh, all of uh, these reports have started to come out, that there is an acceptance across the board of failure at all different levels. Um, and it, that's, that's a good start in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, people accept that they weren't uh, playing to the height of their game, that we need to get them back up there. Uh, and I will be doing my level best. Uh, and with the assistance, of course, of, of the policing authority and all the other, our, our other uh, critical stakeholders, to create the environment in which that can happen. It's not going to be easy in the sense that it's, it, it, this is going to be hard work for all of us. But I'm committed to that hard work. I think it's, an, it's important that we start uh, like leading by example in that context. So we, we show at, at, at uh, top management level in the job first what we mean by ethical behaviour and what we mean by uh, stepping out each day and taking on the challenges of whatever job we're given but within that uh, framework. Um, Commissioner, there's also, I think, an important consideration missing um, in the approach. Although it is a thorough approach and it's comprehensive, I do think there's a very important consideration missing. Um, you describe the uh, reason for not pursuing discipline as um, in, 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 in somewhat of a blanket way. You know, the complications, and, and I <coughs> can understand that. But there is a class of managers in the guards, the divisional officers who are chief superintendents, very senior managers in the guards, responsible for, I think, 26 divisions. Okay, so that's 26. 28. 26 chief superintendents. So it's not the whole body of the guards. Um, and the scale of, of errors and over-reporting and false reporting in those areas, those 28 areas, varied significantly. If you remember, it was in, in the report that you gave us some time ago. Some areas were off the map and completely egregious, 150, 200, 250 percent over uh, uh, what actually occurred. Others were not, or they, or they were less so. The variances were less so. So my question to you is, why is there not a focus in proceeding on the divisional officers, the chief superintendents, in the areas with the most flagrant uh, false recording? And why would they not be held to account? Uh, as well as the half, the 50% or so, who did not respond to the commissioner's request for explanations uh, back when about what happened and why and what they were going to do about it. So you have a cadre of superior officers who are responsible for their divisions and it's clear the behavior varied significantly across those 28. And it seems to me there's a very very poor message if those 28 are treated the same and there isn't a focus and management attention on those that were the most flagrant. I mean, you know, it, they oversaw false data on something as significant as preventing drink driving and ensuring road safety. And it's a it's unlikely that those same people are going to change their behavior and their culture if they only get a directive saying this is going to be disciplinary the next time. That it would seem to me this is about management performance and accountability and it's fully in your remit as commissioner to deal with individuals 
Whether you choose to go disciplinary or not is your call. But in terms of addressing that behavior with them in a very specific, personalized way, this is your division, this is what happened, this is what's unacceptable, and however you want to frame that, that they know this is serious, because that message is gonna go out. If this go, if, if you, if, if, all, if all 28 or 20, 28 chief supers get a directive that going forward, this is gonna be a disciplinary matter, it's not the same as the power of saying to those who were clearly out of line. I'm putting you on notice. And, and, and that person knows that you've met them, you've written to them, you've told them this is unacceptable and it's not to happen again on your watch. Could you respond to that, please? Yes, Maureen. Um, well, as I said in my statement, um, I will be writing not just to the chief superintendents, but to all people of, in, in our management cadre. But I will be specifically honing in on certain failures that happened at chief superintendent level and at superintendent level in the context of a lack of urgency or seriousness that were applied to some of the issues that we're dealing with. I have to say at this stage that the two reports that were produced uh, and the uh, evidence that they produced, it does not uh, reach the, 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 the level of a breach of discipline as is outlined in our regulations. However, it is extremely disappointing uh, some of the issues that you spoke of. And it's not just an issue of issuing a directive and putting everything into the future. I intend, as do the, my, my top management team, over the coming weeks, uh, and we'd like to get this done if we can within a six month period, to visit each region, and we will be doing that in the norm, normal course of business in any event, but I will be meeting all of my chief superintendents right around the country and addressing issues with them on a personal level based on their, uh, how they dealt with the issues that they, they faced uh, or that, they, that were found in, 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 the both, in both reports. This is not just something that can be solved by an issue of an edict or a letter. Far from it. This is going to be some very hard work, taking lots of components uh, uh, to the table, including some of the formal structures that are coming into place, which will be used to measure how we're doing in that space, but essentially ensuring that each of these chief superintendents now become chief champions of the way forward. They're going to be critical, as will the superintendents and the assistant commissioners, in ensuring that we get this new drumbeat I spoke of to the front line, and that the unacceptability of dealing with what are not just perceived, but actual serious and urgent issues are dealt with in that manner uh, as quickly as possible. And are you convinced or assured that that cadre of chief superintendents will respond to that? Yes, I am. Um, it, it, it's a complex area uh, when we try to measure this, and that's where I've spent some considerable time looking at how this developed and how I, I was uh, hoping that I could apply individual accountability uh, in this context. Uh, what I was faced with didn't allow me to do that, but it still comes down to individuals. Uh, and I, I know that uh, many of these people um, have been working at different ranks and have moved around. So some of the issues you spoke of in relation to some areas being very high and others being low, uh, when you look into an area that maybe had very low figures, you'll find that there was uh, you know, a change of management there, which doesn't explain why it would have stayed low. It was a, it, could you attribute it to an individual? There are some things that are very difficult to explain, just looking at the very top level figures. However, we will use that information that we have already gleaned, and without having to go back into that large database, which would take a long, long time, to get our indicators as to what we should do in individualizing that meeting and that face-to-face uh, uh, discussion that needs to happen in relation to how we uh, move forward in this area. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to invite my colleagues uh, to add any questions, but before I do, Commissioner, you described that you would, over the next short while, have an opportunity to meet the divisional officers one by one. Yes. Could I ask you, in your presence at those meetings, to invite them to sign the Code of Ethics, please? 
I think that would be a very symbolic, um, individualized. If you're having the individualized discussion with them that you've discussed with Maureen, then to individually ask them in your presence to sign the Code of Ethics. Yes, Chair, that, that was in the plan. Maybe not for that forum, but it's, it's a suggestion that I will take away. Thank you. Yeah. Now, anybody like to, Pat? Maybe um, while we're talking about the Code of Ethics, um, <clears throat> Commissioner, we're talking about the Code of Ethics, and um, I welcome your statement that everybody will be trained to get face-to-face -face training on the Code of Ethics mm -hmm. by Q2 of next year. Uh, I think that's really, really important now because it is out, it'll be a year and a half from the time it's been published by Q2 of next year, so it's time to do it. Um, I would urge you, though, um, not alone just to get your senior people uh, to sign that they will abide by the Code of Ethics. I think every member, uh, both civilian and Garda uniformed, uh, it is very, very important that they will sign, not just that they've received the training, but sign that they will abide by the Code of Ethics. Uh, that was one point I wanted to make. The second one, just interesting, and uh, maybe it's not something you need to respond to now, but I'm surprised that the behaviour of your senior people would not uh, be a breach of existing discipline regulations. Uh, I just thought that was strange. So maybe it's time, uh, maybe for a review of the disciplinary regulations to be carried out so that action could be taken in the future if there is a reoccurrence. Okay, if I deal with that point first, uh, Pat. Um, obviously, um, in order to establish a prima facie case, you need evidence. In order to get the evidence, you have to go back in to that database, which would give you the uh, prima facie evidence that you would need uh, to, to uh, move it on. Uh, and that's the decision. If we do that, we either do it for everyone, or, or, and that means that it's going to take an inordinate amount of time. Um, and that's the, the balanced decision that I had to take over the past few weeks and in taking all of the information I could get uh, to hand. Of course, we do need to look at our uh, discipline re uh, regulations. I accept that. I, as I said in my opening statement, I have also uh, issued a uh, recommendation to all chief superintendents who in the first instance are the people in charge of discipline for their divisions, uh, that these kind of breaches into the future will be treated as a most serious breach which could uh, end up in individuals being dismissed. So they need to hear that message, that this is something that has been dealt with at the most serious level that it can by the organisation. But I do accept that we need to look at how um, both our formal discipline regulations can be improved, but also there is a suggestion in, 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 my, in my opening statement about the restorative <coughs> piece and how we, we need to focus on changing behaviours. So it's, it, it's, it's a two-pronged approach. But the ultimate sanction should be and has to be very serious in the context of the, the, the breaches that have happened. And that was the second part of your question. I know... Uh, signing for everybody. Oh, yeah, the signing. That, that is part of... I know that uh, um, Paddy Lee is here are in relation to the, the embedding of the Code of Ethics. That is something that is absolutely essential. We have all done that already as a senior management team. We have done that uh, publicly and, and, and signed up to the Code of Ethics. And we hope that would cascade down uh, and I take the suggestion from the chair earlier in relation to how that could be done for our senior management cadre. Thank you. Yeah. Judith? You mentioned as part of your action plan in response to this that each individual member would have a, a performance um, target around data quality or a, you know, certainly a, a performance conversation around data quality. And I just wanted to ask you of your assessment here and now in light of the the Matt Mitt report and indeed the homicide review and other data quality contexts that we have discussed in committee in the authority. Is data actually valued by your organization and is there an understanding of the central position of data to public confidence and not least to help the authority do our job in terms of monitoring performance accurately? Is, that, is there a real understanding of the importance of data quality? Yeah, I think um, any police service, we operate on, on information and data. It's, it's the lifeblood of what we do. And uh, of course, certain data sets are absolutely valued in the context of the day-to-day -day work of the frontline Gardaí. Um, but obviously, where it is seen or perceived that the data is of no immediate value to that individual themselves, it may not be treated in the same way as, it, as, as data where, where they see 
for example, uh, it, you know, our ultimate I suppose, yardstick um, for success is, is shown in the courtrooms of this country. And that's where I think all of our Gardaí focus when they think of data quality and getting data right. But of course, there's a much bigger data set than that. And we have to train people to understand that um, when we're asking them, and again, the ask is as important as the doing. We have to be important in what we ask them to do. We have to be, it's important that we focus on what we ask them to do to ensure that the information we're asking them to record is relevant to what we're doing. Or relevant, relevant to some aspect. Relevant to the deployment of resources. Yes, to, relevant, across the board. Yeah, it, could be, and it could be relevant to another organisation outside of Vanguard the but it's relevant to uh, society. Uh, and we, we are the holders of huge data in the organisation. Uh, some of it is very relevant and seen as relevant immediately to most uh, operational Gardaí, but some might not be, and that's the challenge for us to ensure that the, that, 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 that um, appreciation is, uh, and that's what we'll be doing as part of our performance management piece, to measure not just the piece that they feel is relevant, but across the board. Um, after all that has been said and all that has been written about uh, this issue, a number of fundamental and unanswered questions still remain, and they're to a certain extent are developing that the, the character of mysteries of religion. Why it was that, and I'm not sure that you're going to have an answer to, to this, why it was that so many, so many guards of whatever rank made or encouraged others to make inaccurate or even dishonest returns? Why it was that nobody shouted stop, to coin a phrase? Why it was that no divisional or district officer was sufficiently engaged with their responsibilities to see what was happening before their eyes? I mean, perhaps it is impossible to answer those questions uh, and uh, all of the reports and anything that you've said important though it was at the start of the meeting hasn't really resolved that question but let me ask you two specific questions the first is over the last number of years in a series of reports uh, the O'Higgins report the Crow Horworth report We've seen the two in relation to the fixed um, uh, penalty notices. Internal investigations conducted into these issues, or a variety of issues, within the Garda Síochána have been found wanting in subsequent external reviews. And the Garda Síochána has at its command all of the investigative resources of the state. Does that worry you? Does it cause you to think that in reviewing significant issues like this within the Garda Síochána, it may be necessary or at the very least desirable to introduce some element of externality? Not because there aren't entirely competent people within the Garda Síochána, but maybe it's very difficult to stand outside of the day-to-day -day work that one is doing and the associations one has to cast a cold eye on whatever issue it might be. It is striking that there is this series of, um, if you like, uh, collateral criticisms, <coughs> sideline criticisms, and sometimes very direct criticisms uh, of internal investigations. Okay. Um, your first point in relation to um, you know, the, the difficult question to answer, and we will be looking again, and, and, and the two reports that we have, and a point made earlier by Maureen in relation to the, um, the variance between the different areas. So obviously there's pockets of good practice there. Not everyone, not everyone was doing the thing wrongly or not calling out. So, somebody had to be doing something right amongst all of that that was going on when you had such a variance across divisions and, and, and districts. Therefore, I think the challenge for me and for the senior team is to ensure that we get the learning out of that, that we do find out where these people were that managed to keep things under control, 
and to identify why they were so focused on the data quality element that, that uh, Judith spoke of, uh, and how they managed to get that message across to their people. Uh, so that there's learning there for us. In the context of the internal investigations, um, you know, I'd come back again to the, um, I suppose, the focus and the seriousness with which these things are taken. If it's just seen as an add-on to a day's work, something needs to be just done, and that same level of rigour mightn't apply. So again, there's a, a challenge there for us, and we have heard and seen the outcome of those um, uh, fora and reports that you've spoken to. And again, I, I think he, this is where the learning has to happen for us. This is where we have to focus on ensuring that once an appointment is made, it has to be seen as something absolutely important or it wouldn't happen in the first place. It may mean that we, uh, in the, as we reorganise ourselves in the context, say, of the divisional model and start focusing people in areas of specialty or in, in the functional way, that we can ensure that a high level of approach is taken to all of these issues and people can dedicate time. Because I think if we look at some of the research that we carried out in the context of, of the, the divisional model and the functional model, one of the most set upon ranks in the organisation in relation to, to being asked to do a lot are the superintendents. They're asked to do an awful lot uh, and they, they serve as external agencies as well in the context of their day's work. This puts huge pressure on them and uh, as also at the inspector rank. So I think we have to look at ways in which we can distribute that work. Uh, it's all important work. It has, it, it, as I said, if an appointment is made, it means that we need to uh, apply the same level of rigour to that as we would to a serious crime that we'd be investigating. You know, we, we, we all know, all operational uh, Gardy know that when the big thing happens, it's going to get sorted. We, everyone puts their shoulders at the wheel and we get a result. Where we fall down is in the volume stuff in the middle. And I think that's where we need to refocus. We need to have our middle managers uh, you know, re refocus on that area and support them. They need to be supported as well. You talk about going external. Obviously, there's some external elements to that area of, of, of uh, investigation into our um, into discipline and, and into uh, criminality, if that exists. Uh, and that's welcome. Uh, but it also involves work coming back to the Garda Sihana in that, in that event. So I, I think uh, there's no quick answer to it. Uh, it's something that we have to uh, apply a lot of thought to. I think we, we need to, to, in slow time now, think where is the learning, where the learning points in this are for us and take that uh, into our training regime and take it into our operational front line as well. And at all times, having a focus on quality and being fair to the individuals that we're tasking, that we give them the proper resources to do their jobs. Thanks. Um, you said in response to one of Maureen's questions, I think that you had a sense of uh, um, uh, a widespread awareness of the of a sense of that there had been a failure that people had uh, had not played to their strength as it were do you really think that across the entire organization that everybody in the organization is with you in what you said in your opening statement do you think that those people who saw this whole issue as being a technical or administrative thing are those people who thought there shouldn't be any importance to collecting this data, these data anyway? Or do you think that those people who didn't see or chose not to see what was happening around them are the division officers who didn't bother to respond to the then commissioner? Do you think that everybody is with you in this? Do you think that there is no task to be done in bringing the organisation, everybody in it, to a full realisation of the extent to which this has raised fundamental questions and has been a, and poses a really serious, even, I, won't, I won't say existential challenge, but a really serious challenge to the relationship between the Garda Síochána and the people whom it serves. Do you think everybody is with you on that? Well, what I'd say, Bob, is we, we've had some um, 
first of all, personally, as I move around the country, and I, I can't know of everybody because I can't meet everyone, but I can say that there, there is a realisation in the commentary I hear, and I, I keep listening for that amongst my own uh, colleagues at headquarters as well in relation to what they're hearing, and in, in relation to our senior leadership meetings uh, in the context of what's happening right around the country. There is a realisation. I'm not saying we have everyone, but I can say that over the past few weeks, we have engaged with the associations of all levels in the organisation, and, there's re and there is, there is a, an acceptance there that this is an, an issue for all of us, not just for management. This is an issue for everybody in Angar de Shikhana. It is not just about a, um, a statement or a, an edict issuing today. It's about a long piece of work. We need to keep this in people's memories. We need to keep this alive in the forefront of their minds as a huge disappointment for the organisation. If we had pursued discipline or had gone in to look at this big database, we would have kept that in the forefront of people's mind. But I would say in a very counterproductive way over time. We need to, 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 to uh, grab that same space now in a productive way and say, right, you're not going to be let forget about this. This was a serious assault on our credibility as an organisation and we need to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And for as long as it takes to get people to a level where we can be, or you more importantly, can be confident that, we're, that we are operating at that level, we have to keep that very, very much in a, in, into the forefront of our minds, I'd say. I'll come back to a number of other linked issues to when we talk about the MRP later on. Thanks. Right, thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier, Maureen also referred to it, to the referencing Crow Howard, to the significant variation across regions. Another forum, you mentioned the difficulty in terms of um, personal accountability, the amount of movement um, yes. that is taking place within regions, particularly at Chief, Chief Superintendent, but at, yes. at, over, at other levels as well. But it occurs to me, as I look across the extent of the over-reporting and the dishonest reporting, and that there was a culture embedded in terms of this particular area, notably right, right across the country, which, was, which is seriously problematic and worrying. My concern is that the whole area of accountability and supervision is called into question as a consequence of this. And I'm thinking in terms of the wider potential for that, not just, not just confined to the two areas that were subject, that were subject uh, to um, reporting here and subject to uh, scrutiny. And I'd be interested in your perspective, Commissioner, in relation to your confidence about that element of supervision. We've raised it time and time again, I think, at previous meetings and in different contexts. And the extent of accountability at the various levels across the organisation and the initiatives that you're currently putting in place to address what I think will be a widespread concern. Yeah. Well, we didn't need this particular crisis to realise that we had an issue with supervision, um, you know, but this is a, this is definitely a component of uh, how this particular crisis grew: uh, the lack of supervision, and uh, even where we had supervision, the quality of that supervision. So there are a few, there are challenges there for us. Uh, I know that if one looks at the ratio of supervisory ranks to frontline that we're possibly in around the same as most other uh, European police services. Therefore, the question arises, if that's the case, where are they? Uh, and that is a question that we have posed to ourselves. And that is something, as part of what we're doing in the context of moving this situation out from where we are, is that we would, in the first instance, we have lots of vacancies due to uh, uh, circumstances beyond our control in relation to moratoriums, etc. That will soon be back on track. Uh, once we have that cohort and we have them allocated, it's not going to stop there. We are going to ensure that the civilianisation programme, which has been, uh, uh, I suppose, funded by government uh, over the next few years and will be managed through, through yourselves in relation to the recruitment aspect, that they also will facilitate a move from uh, offices to the front line of people uh, who are trained supervisors. 
we need to look at the quality of that training then. We need to make sure that people step up to the rank that they're given, that they realise the responsibility that goes with it. I think we have a piece of work to do in that area. So it's a multifaceted, but the first challenge, obviously, uh, and it's a, it's a positive story, that the, 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 the numbers are going to increase, thankfully. Uh, the numbers of Gardaí at the front line, of course, are going to increase also. So that's all positive in the context of solving other issues for us. And but performance right, management. And performance management is right in the middle of it. And uh, by next year, we will have that, uh, and we will have it at all ranks, uh, and we'll ensure uh, that the critical issues for the organisation, the fundamental foundation stones that are, are required for public confidence in our service are set into that, and that, that it's reflected in what we do. Okay, um, I'd like to just make a couple of remarks, and then I'm going to invite Valerie to take up the HR pieces uh, in the context of the MRP just so people know what's coming. Um, Commissioner, you know, the authority has said from a number of occasions now that we saw this located in a performance management context. And so against that backdrop, I think it's fair to say that we understand your approach to the wide scale discipline, um, disciplinary action that you've outlined. I'm not saying whether we agree with it, it's your decision and we made that clear uh, a month ago. Um, but we certainly understand it. And I hope in turn that you might understand that performance management also includes confronting underperformance. So let's just park the word discipline. It involves confronting underperformance. And in that regard, we were concerned about what I call sins of omission, not just sins of commission. So the failure to follow up on the manual summonses is something that causes us deep unease because of the unfairness <coughs> for those who uh, who paid up, mm -hmm. and uh, when, I don't want to, to, to debate it now, but we, we, we had a preliminary discussion upstairs about the issues in the juvenile diversion programme, and again, we're concerned about omissions there, and we're going to be following that up with you at official level, and I know you're doing an examination, and we'll be paying really close attention. And the reason I'm connecting them, I suppose, is I want you to understand in turn that the reason the authority made the points it made a few weeks ago is we were seriously bothered by what we saw in terms of the senior management response uh, in your organization. And so we welcome your focus on the senior managers. Um, and in addition to the code of ethics, I'd like an assurance from you that these, the personalized uh, letters that you're going to write to the senior team will be placed on their files. I'd also like, um, because you focused, and I think quite rightly, on the pockets of good practice and how to, how to spread the good practice around. We'd like to ask you to supply the authority with professional standards reports because we have only received the annual reports to date, but we'd like to get the actual reports because we assume that in there we will find these pockets of good and bad practice. And, and, and I completely understand that you need to take those and industrialize them. So we'd like to have a look at those uh, if you don't mind. And I guess the other point that was made about internal investigative capacity that was made by Bob is something we'll be watching carefully because, as Bob has outlined, there's a pattern there. And, uh, you know, the next issue, if there is another problem where there's a weak investigative report followed by a strong external report, that would cause us unease. So I'm, I'm just flagging these. Uh, as concerns for you. But maybe you'd like to respond to the issues around underperformance, um, letters on files and so on. Yeah, I can give you those assurances, Chair. Uh, Thank you. Of course, um, I think we have to do everything that we can uh, to ensure everyone in the organisation uh, realises that this is their issue and their problem. If they cannot pass it on to anybody else. Uh, and while some were, were more, uh, I suppose, involved in, 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 in some of the issues that, 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 uh, that, that were reported on, uh, every individual, both Garda and civilian, in this organisation has a role to play in ensuring that we reach that new area of high standards that we are hoping to achieve, uh, not just from within, but also with the help of those from without. Uh, and I can, again, reassure you that that is something we're looking at. I accept the low performance piece, of course, uh, 
uh, this is possibly one of the reasons that we would have welcomed the performance management system anyway, uh, because it gives us a framework on which we can look at that in the context of uh, how the team is working, how individuals are working. Uh, and um, so I think it will take some time to bed in, but I think in the context of the challenge we currently face and the realisation across the board that is something we have to tackle. I think uh, everyone will see this as a way and a good and useful framework by which to achieve that. And finally, sorry Valerie, I'm taking your time. Can I encourage you to engage with the civilian unions on the same basis as you engage with the Garda associations? While um, they, f they feature in a much smaller way in the Crow Horrors report, there are a couple of recommendations yes. uh, that are relevant and I think if you know that unified cross-organisational report would be unfortunate if you didn't bring I those on board as well. Fully accept that. Chair. Thank you. Valerie. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, I suppose I'd like to move the discussion on to a more strategic view of, of, of some of the, um, the pieces that have been mentioned so far. Uh, before I do, actually, and you've mentioned there are pockets of excellence, and, and I think um, it would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge as an authority the, the excellent work that we hear about all of the time in some areas, and particularly organised crime, you've had recent successes. But in every community, we all see individual successes of individual guardian and individual units. So um, I think what we're all about here is just trying to get a grip on some of the pieces that have, have, have come through so many of these reports as being consistent failures in a broader context where we recognise there's very good work being done by very dedicated and very committed people and we would want that message to land as well, okay? So in that context, um, I would just like to look for a moment and think, you, you, you've mentioned in your opening statement, we're, we're a couple of years here at this stage hearing various reports, we've done a lot of work with your team and everything comes down to the quality of work done by the people you have. There would be no Garda Shia Kona, it is down to the people you have. You have 13,000 thereabouts at the moment. You're, you're heading towards massively increased numbers in the next few years. You, you, you mentioned in passing, uh, and we've seen in the MRP programme reference to various actions that all acknowledge are required. We have performance management, learning strategies, training coordination. And, and something that keeps coming home to us as an authority is that where is the people plan coming together? And it is sur surprising and I think mystifying to us at this stage that, that there isn't a document that's called a HR strategy from Garda Siakona, you know, a, a, a piece of communication that would describe your leadership approach, your whole, how your whole um, policing strategy is to be implemented by people, how you go from selecting the best, not everybody can be a guard, not everybody could, would be good enough and have the right capabilities to a guard, but how do you go through the stages of selecting the right people, recruits, give them the, the right development in Templemore, consistently refreshing, consistently motivating, consistently monitoring and measuring the culture. And we're seeing it in pockets and we know the intent is there. But maybe you could just ask, at such a time of change and challenge, and particularly in the next few years, can you explain why the organisation has not developed a HR strategy which would articulate for members and for the public the end goal of these changes, but in particular how, will they, how they will impact on, 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 on the service the Gardaí provides, but most importantly on the people providing those services? Because it just seems to be a massive strategic weakness. Yeah, uh, I accept that. Um, I have to say that um, since uh, the moratorium was lifted and uh, we've started recruitment and promotions, uh, that I'd say there isn't a HR uh, section in the country that isn't as busy as ours at the moment in relation to just the process and getting things done. Absolutely. Uh, and they've been hugely busy in that and hugely successful at getting huge numbers through uh, all the different pipes that we, and we're so happy to see that. But I, I fully accept that behind all of that, we need that clear framework and strategy. Uh, and I know that uh, Joe's here and he can talk to maybe some of the detail of that. Uh, and you know, it is a priority for us. It's an absolute priority. It has been, 
Uh, and, you know, it hasn't uh, happened as easily or as quickly as we would yeah. like. But I'd let Joe... I'll describe. commissioner, in fact, very often... Uh, I'm sorry, I'd be, uh, yeah. we have our HR... I was just going to say, because very often I'd be bringing the questions back to yourself as the, as the chief sort of yes. accountable person. But, but this is where I would expect that you have key people around you... Oh, yes, indeed. ..to, yes. to, to give yeah. you this. Well, so I know, maybe uh, your colleagues would like yeah. to address it. Our exec director of yeah. HR is, is here. He can yeah, I have, have, several, yeah. I have several points to make, uh, Valerie. There is uh, a document... There is I think we've seen a strategy for the development of the HR function, yes, but I, I, I think if I'm right, John, we haven't seen a strategy for the people in the organisation. So, so the two are inextricably connected. You talked about the supply chain of talent in the organisation. Uh, that is called out in all its detail as to where we get people from, how it suggests that they need to be calibrated. And we talk about how it is we're doing right now and what it needs to change to to make the move from the scale that we're at right now, 16,000 people, to the 21,000 people. We had meetings with a subcommittee of the PA, the, the PA uh, dealing with the subset of that, dealing with the reserve just recently and the strategy that fits in around that. And in our last discussion at the Organisational Development Committee, I drew a distinction, which I don't know whether it was accepted or not, in answer to a question from Moling about the piece that says the totality of the organisational strategy determines the HR input to it. And that's what we're seeking dynamically, as the Commissioner said, to address right now. So if, if you haven't seen the documents, and I think, I think they're, they're, well, no, they're I, available I, I, and signed off. I'm, on, I'm on the OD committee, as you know, John, and, and we, we had this conversation. But the, the question still, I suppose, um, is one that we don't fully um, appreciate in the sense that, in practical terms, um, we don't see that there's a coordinated training, training and learning and development strategy which considers all the different priorities that are there in the organisation at the moment, set out clearly in the policing plan and in the right. MRP. And what we do see then is conflicting demands on a limited resource. Absolutely. And, and, and we don't see a point um, where those demands are being prioritised in a coordinated way from a HR strategic standpoint in the context of a, of a people vision for the organisation so, so that just, brings all that together. Just to address the issue of documentation, because mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely critical. There is, as the Commissioner said in his opening address, a draft of the training and development strategy and the connection between that and policing plan 218. That is a document right now which is doing the rounds in our house okay. uh, because it's on its way to you. Uh, we've that is seen, one component yeah. element. So yeah. if, I could just, if I could just try and Thanks, address the, the, the connectivity of some of this key stuff. We're dealing with the dynamic of that growing organisation and the kinds of training needs we talked about here today, born of Crow Howarth and a whole series of reports in the history. And we are trying to prioritise, and that's the key word, and I would accept your point absolutely in that regard. Trying to prioritise, for example, the, the commitment we made to Pat at the Ethics Committee that ethics would go to number one in that list. It didn't get there by accident, but it did displace those other elements that were at that point prioritised one and two. So we are trying to measure and manage this in a dynamic with resources that are right now extremely strained and limited. You know you've been to the college, you've seen the, the loading on the faculty that is the college with 800 students there in four classes of 200. Our recruitment on the civilian side is ramping up, and the training activity there is absolutely a requirement for induction and for appropriate landing. And the strategy that I'm calling out in relation to the reserve is in discussion with yourselves, and we've, we've, we've met and discussed on this. So this is a very real-time thing, responding to the growing organisation and trying to address, as we're going to do today, reflecting back to you the kind of priorities you're putting on us. And if I could say one final thing, the commonality of team between the contributions pretty much of everybody, commencing with Maureen, is this issue of calibration. How it is that we measure goodness? How it is that we inculcate in the organisation the standard appropriate? And that is a very key issue to be taken back in to make certain that the resources that we have to spend on training hit that target. And to quote back to Bob, you know, to give people the power on the soft stuff to show stop when stop is required to be said. We've got some significant issues. And you mentioned they're operating real time. I totally appreciate the 
challenge of operating in real time, lots of moving parts. Would you comment on whether in that context is even more appropriate and in fact regular in most organisations to have a strategic HR plan which looks ahead and tries to anticipate yes. what might arise in real time? And that's what I thought we have described, what I've sought to describe to you, that it is just that kind of quarterly review that we do in sync with our workforce planning initiative, which is quarterly, and we try and ensure that in looking at this, as the organisational footprint expands, that we are beginning to respond in ever more detail <coughs> to where it is our retirements fall, where it is the density of new recruits coming into the organisation, an issue you and I have discussed, where it is we've got density of people in the CPD schools, and the issue arising then for supervision. Okay, I think we're on two sort okay. of parallel lines of thought, because I completely take what you're saying. What we've been asking for for quite some time now is, where does this all come together in a HR strategic plan? We're also working with your IT colleagues, and I think Pat will come to that shortly, to see how does it all fit together, what are the priorities, and how does it fit with organisational needs? So organisational needs, we see the huge growth that's happening in the organisation. We see the issues coming out of all of these reports, including the current one that we're talking about today. We see a complete understanding across the management team of the challenges to be faced. And I suppose we're looking for the HR strategy in terms of bringing professional HR solutions to the table. I think if there's one thing that I am severely confused about as to whether or not the document that we are calling our HR strategy in response to the MRP, which we developed with the uh, MRP organisation in accordance with its profile, whether or not that's meeting the particular points that you're raising. Okay. Clearly you're, you're not reading it in that yeah. context. I'm not, we, we did discuss this at a recent meeting and yeah. perhaps it was a meeting, John, you weren't at yourself. Okay. But to our view, that is a, I think we're confusing in terms of docu documentation. And it's, it's, the document only represents the thinking, it's the thinking we're looking for, but manifested in something, in some piece of communication. Um, we would see the document that we've seen as being a plan for the HR function in an administrative sense, primarily. We would be looking for the broader vision, visionary piece. And what we can't understand is why in an organisation of your size, and maybe I come back to the Commissioner or Mr Nugent on this one, why it doesn't exist and why we haven't seen it in this year's policing plan and we would hope to see it prominent in next year's policing plan, in the plan of work for the year, which is we know is the policing plan. I think, Valerie, I think the, the point you make about the coordination, the need for linkages, the need for associations with um, setting out how the development of people, how their relationship, what their behaviours are like, how they will grow in the organisation, what their roles might be, what their expectations might be, that's clearly missing. And I think to pick up where we were on, on the last conversation around, <coughs> excuse me, underperformance, around performance indeed, around behaviours and attitudes, I think that, that visionary piece that, 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 that you're referencing is, is criti it's a critical absent, mm. and it's something that, that I'll talk I mean, to. I, I'm to wondering at the about. moment today what it feels like, who, if regard they, who, and they'll hear news reports today, and we're discussing all of the issues that have arisen with a view to finding solutions and making progress, and I think we're working together positively on that. But, Commissioner, you said yourself, and you do have terms like sloppy, lazy, unprofessional. If I was a guard or a recruit joining or somebody thinking of joining the Gardaí, where is the expression on behalf of the organisation that, that sets out the vision for how my ta contribution will be maximised, my talent will be developed, my motivation will be encouraged, my fitness or wellness or well-being might be supported. My, you, you know, wh where, where is that vision for the organisation? And not just to serve the individual member, but to serve the organisation. Where, where is the vision for the team? Because I just have a concern that, um, again, for the individual guard who we absolutely want to maximise their own talents, to be motivated, to be rewarded, to be recognised. Where is that picture coming together? And where does the inspector and the superintendent, and the chief superintendent, see the roadmap for, for, this, for, for how all of these problems of how they manage their people are going to be addressed? Because what we seem to be seeing is, is something of a patchwork. There's a bit of a training strategy here. Now, I'm not undermining these. These, these actions are all 
totally needed and laudable and, and absolutely. But we're seeing a piece here and this path there and this code of ethics over here. And I, we just feel as an authority, we've debated this, where is the whole vision here? Because I have no doubt it is in the minds of several of, of the senior people we have met, but we don't see a cohesive picture. And perhaps this is what's required at this point in time. Okay. You know, I, I accept that uh, absolutely. In, but I, I, I would counter it by saying, um, at a time, I, I see as uh, there are three major challenges for the organisation at the moment, and we never needed that vision more than we do now. Yes. Uh, and as you said, there's lots of elements of the, of the jigsaw there and, and the mosaic, uh, and, but they need to be brought together. Uh, because uh, we are doing the day job, which yes. is keeping the people of this country safe. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, that's our primary objective. Mm -hmm. And that has to take precedence over everything else. We are also managing a very, very ambitious program of modernization. Mm -hmm. And then we're dealing with the issues that we're here talking about today in the earlier part of this. Uh, some legacy, some, some not that old, some that are fairly, uh, that are recent and that are actually there at the moment that we need to deal with. I think that framework, that contextualized piece, that the strategic piece is critical for someone just to sit and look and, and, and get that reassurance. I think, you know, we've been so busy at all the different components. We have been uh, putting so much work on different individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have been, uh, you know, I know that, in, for example, I just mentioned the HR function themselves, have been hugely busy in just getting people in the door. Mm -hmm. But we do need to stand back and get that clarity in relation to the strategic HR yeah. vision that we need. By the way, I yeah. think mosaic is a much better term than my term patchwork, and I appreciate mm. that. But it, it's this sense that just as, you know, you may have a policing strategy, without a HR strategy, the danger is you're putting bricks on an unsolid foundation and that you're not looking ahead in terms of the, 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 the you know, the needs of the, of the, the base. I take yeah. the point, Father. We need to align to our members, anyone who's looking at that, what does it mean to, to, to be yeah. at work yeah. in Angkor the Shikana? Yeah. We need to inspire them to see and encourage them and to promote the best behaviours, to promote an awareness of what an, an extraordinary organisation is to work for. And to do that, you do need to pull all of the components of the type we talked about, whether that relates to performance management, whether it relates to learning and development, whether it relates to career progression, to encourage people to say, yes, I really want to be in the organisation, I want to progress to the organisation, I want to perform to the best of my ability, I want to be in the best team that I can. And I think the HR strategy that you talk about is, is that piece that's missing. And, and I, we certainly recognise that, and okay. it's something Thanks, we'll, we'll, we will take away and revert uh, to, to the committee on. Oh, OK, and th thank you for that. Thanks, Valerie. And just to, to add to that, um, like you have a most extraordinary opportunity because you're a growing organisation. And over the next five years, I think is correct, Valerie, correct me if I'm wrong, about half of the people in your organisation will be new. So the reason that we're placing such emphasis on it is modernising by the old culture and the old jobs and the old ways of working just misses this huge opportunity. And so that's why we're really keen that there is that visionary piece so that you're modernising in a context which recognises that your entire organisation Half of it is going to change in a few years. And that's, it's a huge risk, mm. a huge challenge, but it's also an enormous opportunity. And I'm big on the half, glass half full stuff. That's the opportunity piece I think we'd like to see expressed and, and to be able to harness all that. I mean, you'll be, lose, you'll be gaining 800 people a year and you'll have about 300 people retiring a year in any organisation. That's a massive change to handle. And, and, and it can only be handled by looking ahead and being strategic. And I absolutely do appreciate John's point about, you know, HR strategy falling from an organisation strategy. But, but the reality is, is, as you said, real time is moving fast. But you do, but you do, you have to work, I suppose, with what you can see. And if you can look three years out, you can certainly look three, five years out in terms of your HR numbers and all the needs around that. So it is a huge opportunity. So I'd, I'd like to thank you for responding to that, Commissioner. Thanks, yeah. Bob? Thanks, Chair. Um, so I wanted to move on to the the modernization and renewal program which uh, which was um has been referred to a number of times and some of the issues have already been touched upon but to echo something that valerie said 
one of the things that has, has struck us over time, over the last nearly two years, but particularly in the course of the last year, is this sense that while the MRP is the clearest existing statement of the future direction of the organisation in terms of where it wants to be and how it's going to get there, there is this sense of disconnected elements being part of the foundation on which it's being built. And that there's a lack of integration and coherence between those various elements which will enable it to happen. And, and the HR strategy is one of them. The development of an ICT strategy is another, and they would be, that would be touched upon later. But simply on the HR strategy, not to exhaust the topic or ourselves to distraction, but simply to make this point. We don't for a second think that there isn't imaginative thinking going on within the organisation, or that you're less alive to the future than, than we are. But it is the apparent absence of that, that integrated approach which will enable the organisation to respond more rapidly, more effectively, more comprehensively to changes from within or changes from without. And every organisation everywhere in the times in which we live is affected by both types of change. As the Chair said, 50% of the Garda members will have <coughs> less than five years service. That has huge implications for their induction, for their training, for all the rest of it. It has huge implications for their supervision and the cadre of people from whom the supervisory groups can be drawn. And for the training and formation of the supervisory groups. Uh, it is, it, it's, it's not just a chicken and an egg situation. It's the notion that a quail's egg can make a chicken. Uh, and unless you have the seeds of the solution, you won't have the solution. And a clear HR strategy that identifies what the key strategic issues are. We know you're aware of them. We know you're thinking about them. But they're not being given public evidence so that they can be built into the way in which you develop the MRP, your colleagues across the organization live the change that the MRP represents, and so that we, in discharge of our oversight responsibility, not out of curiosity, but to discharge our statutory oversight responsibility, will have a sense of how these issues are being addressed. And Training is a crucially significant subset of that. You mentioned it in relation to the issues that you were addressing in your opening statement. But at the same time, there's a training obligation in relation to the Code of Ethics, as John has identified and to which Pat has referred. There are training needs in relation to the annual intake over the next number of years of the 800 uh, Garda members <coughs> and the 500 civilian members. Somebody somewhere is going to have to make a strategic decision as to how those contested, contestable, contesting training requirements will be met. That's the kind of issue that a HR strategy will help to resolve. Hmm. And maybe on that issue of training, are you confident that you will have the capacity or you will be able to engineer the capacity to deliver that whole range of training initiatives that you've identified today as well as the pre-existing ones because of the accelerated intake of people? And are you confident that you would be able to develop less clunky, uh, and I refer to the Crow Horwath report, uh, more flexible, more distributed across the country uh, types of training to meet those challenges over the next four or five years? Okay. Um, if I can say, the whole area of training um, is a, it's an enabler for much of what's in the MRP uh, and then it's business as usual as well. So uh, the, the introduction of the MRP and all that entails has put a huge additional layer of training requirement on the organisation at a time when we are uh, recruiting historic numbers into the organisation, at a time when we are um, filling a lot of specialist vacancies that also attract a training element. 
So it is a risk for the organisation at this point in time. Uh, and it's a, it's a risk that has forced us back to the table to reprioritise. And to go back to the earlier conversation, what must be prioritised for the organisation is in laying those foundation stones. And whatever that takes from the point of view of training will be prioritised. There's a cost to training. Uh, and on that basis, we have to ensure that we get the wherewithal uh, from a point of view of being able to afford the training that we want to put on uh, to make available to our members. And then there's the capacity of the members to actually uh, take on the training uh, and the abstraction that that co costs and everything else. We are well aware of all of the elements in that kind of, uh, I suppose, equation at the moment, and it is causing us some worry in the context of being able to meet all of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the promises we've made in the MRP, uh, because um, over the past uh, few months, uh, you know, things have come out of left of field, which had to be addressed from an operational point of view, and that has taken a chunk of training away. Uh, it is going to leave us in a much better space in that regard, obviously, you know, uh, and by early next year. Uh, the moratorium has done it to us in the context of just trying to backfill our vacancies at supervisory level, which again is essential for all of the uh, work we want to achieve in the context of raising the standard and the values and the ethics in the organisation. These are the things, these are the building blocks, the essential building blocks in my view, that we cannot pu uh, push down the prioritised list. We have to keep them at the top until they're completed. Uh, so that may mean that some of the elements of the MRP will have to get delayed uh, due to uh, just a capacity issue from a, a human resource point of view, but also from a, 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 a money point of view, a finance point of view. Um, and that's one of the things that we're dealing with at the moment, and we are looking very closely, and have asked our MRP office to look at the prioritisation of, of, of uh, what we have uh, in the context of a few very ambitious projects, which will, when delivered, raise the whole organisation and will have a reach into every corner of the organisation. I'm talking there on the ICT front. And, and they would be great to have front-loaded. But I don't believe that uh, we can put that ahead of what I talked about as being the f fund fundamental building blocks of what we want to achieve as an ethical, value, uh, strong values organisation. Uh, and that's where we're going to prioritise our uh, fairly, uh, I suppose, uh, small training capacity element that we have available to us over the coming 12 months and, and, and further. Uh, so if that answers your question, Bob, yes. in the context of... Yeah. Yeah. Just maybe, Bob, if I, if I could add to that, Bob, just in relation to... to um, the, the Commissioner spoke about the prioritisation piece. So the, the, the Executive Director has been tasked specifically with looking at the MRP and what is going to what, what prioritisation is going to look like. And that's a specific piece of work. I suppose the challenge we face is doing all this while we continue to do, to do the policing every day. And, and we, 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 we um, I think in the Commissioner's opening speech, uh, when he was addressing probably what we, what, what we are saying is that the greatest challenge we've ever faced, um, that is an integrated approach. And all of the elements that's required for integration are required in the plan that the Commissioner outlined at the outset of, 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 of today's event, where he talked about the supervision, the, 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 the deployment, the training, the policy, everything that's required around ethics, around culture, everything that we're saying must be a priority now because of the challenges that we currently face. That obviously is going to have an impact on our MRP, and that's a piece of work that, that we've asked our, our Executive Director to do. But the integration in relation to that is hugely important and something we really, really accept and acknowledge, particularly, as everyone says, on, on the other hand, the organisation continues to grow every month, every, every week. So doing all this together is, is, the, is the real challenge. The, the, the sole objective of everything that we're doing here and everything we're talking about is to improve the quality of daily policing and the service that's provided to the community and to ensure that your organisation is able to offer that service. These things have no end in themselves. They're, they're there simply as a means to that end, but they're extremely important and crucial means to the end. And can I ask just two quick questions, Chair, in relation to the MRP, the first, to the Commission. The first is, 
In the third quarterly report that the authority submitted to the minister in, in relation to the um, achievement of the uh, recommendations that are contained in the inspectorate's report on changing policing in Ireland. Do you think that analysis was fair? Um, do you think that what we said was a reasonable uh, judgment on where things stand at the moment? Yes, I do. Um, in the context of looking at it, and as you said uh, earlier, when you step back and look at something, you may see it differently. Uh, and you coming in, having a look at that uh, in, in detail, we're able to make some calls and things where we had made a different call, uh, but there's learning in that for us as well. I think uh, that's, that's where I welcome the scrutiny. I welcome that level of oversight because it makes us focus more on the detail and making sure that what the information that we're giving back to you is absolutely accurate. Uh, and in that context, yes, I think it was fair. But I'd also say, that I would hope to see a huge improvement in that area in the context of you getting a call being made that is accurate at a given time. So, uh, for example, some people who will work very uh, valiantly at delivering on an initiative and put a huge amount of energy and effort into it, and they're almost there, but they haven't got that last brick put in place, uh, but they feel, you know, it's working well. It's like a car. It has the four wheels, it might be missing the back windscreen, but everything else is in place so it can drive. But something is missing, so it doesn't pass the test. It's not a complete car. Uh, so that's where we need that level of scrutiny, I think, and we welcome that uh, because there are some elements which are outside our control. So I think we have to learn that we have to say, in as much as we can deliver on this, it is complete. But there's a chunk over here that where we're depending on someone else, and we have to be honest in that, in that space and give a, an accurate reflection. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, and thank you for those uh, observations and for that answer. And the second question is, you've incorporated into the policing plan for 2018 or into the draft document for 2018 the, some of the priorities, well, all of the priorities that the authority identified in its second quarterly report, and that's very flattering. But is it just, we want to be satisfied that it isn't just flattering. <laughs> That these, that these actually are the priorities that you want to be part of the policing plan, not just for 2018 and into the future. And if you're a simple yes will be a very satisfactory answer to that question. <laughs> or a no would be an equally but, satisfactory well, I, one. But it, I'll, because I, know I, I'll, say, I'll say yes, Chair. I think, uh, but I'll say yes uh, in the context the of, you know, this is another perspective. And it goes back to being so close to a problem that you mightn't see the full solution. And you need that other set of eyes looking at a problem or looking at some uh, issue in society that needs a bit more uh, maybe uh, in-depth analysis from, from, a, from a policing point of view or, or, or more attention. And that is where I think the, the, that's where the synergy comes. I think that's where we can get uh, a more, um, again, <coughs> meaningful policing plan. That, that, that when people look at it and read it, something resonates there. Not every page is going to resonate with everybody, but something in there is going to resonate, should. This plan, our policing plan should resonate with every citizen in some way. They should see something there that actually means something to them. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Morning. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got three significant areas to cover uh, within a short period of time, so I'll be as concise as I possibly can in terms of questioning. The first area I'm going to address is the area of governance. And in the third quarterly report, you will have seen reference to the concerns of the authority in relation to, in relation to the whole area of governance. Um, you're, you're aware of the 201 outstanding recommendations uh, in the MRP and the, and the responsibilities that sit with the Strategic Transformation Office. But we were also aware of the 86 recommendations that sit with, um, with the Deputy Commissioner. And um, the, the, uh, you had assured the authority uh, that a unified reporting structure would be in place um, in terms of reporting to the authority. I'm just concerned, or if you can reassure the, the authority that there's an effective governance process in place that takes sight of all the recommendations yes. um, and, and ensures there's a, a coherent approach to, uh, to the uh, organizational change that's involved in those. Yeah, I, I, I was deeply involved in that whole process at the time it was uh, being developed in the context of Report 11. 
and the initial request of our STO office at the time was, how many of these recommendations are you already working on? Can you tell us what's already, that's already up and running in the context of what the, the recommendations are? They were, came back and said, this chunk, there were some that fell outside of what was then in the MRP. But as far as I'm concerned, and always was, everything is in the MRP. If there's a recommendation we've accepted, we have to put it in there and make sure that it gets overseen, it gets managed, and it gets done. Uh, is, is the avenues that bring the whole lot together. Yes, and so nothing falls outside of MRP, and I know that Aidan is here uh, today. Um, so that while, while the early stages of that process, of course, everything was allocated to people who had, were in the area, in whose area that recommendation referred. Um, some of it fell outside the STO, and it never, it didn't go in at that early stage, but it is in there now. And, it, and that's the level of governance that I would expect to happen, including uh, this current piece of work in relation to Crow Haworth that John is going to manage and project manage. We have to have visibility of that also within that space because they are all connected and resolution to those issues are all interconnected. And we need that level of oversight and visibility so we get, right, yeah. we, get the, we get the synergies in relation to some of the enablers I just spoke of, like training. You're quite right on the interconnectedness yeah. issue. Yeah. And what I'm concerned about um, is for you, Commissioner, and indeed for your senior team, the sort of structure that you've got in place to ensure that there's a coherent line of sight across the, yes. across the uh, entire, what, what then comes to whatever, 280, 290 recommendations. Yes. Because ultimately, you're quite, that's the, right. it's the interconnectedness brings it together in terms of ensuring the change. Yeah, and that's a challenge. Um, uh, if you just take the, uh, the projects on their own and, and uh, technically manage them over here. But then you have the people whose, whose daily work is affected by that and who need to actually apply their skills to it as a part-time job because they're also doing other stuff for us. And you then have, You may have misunderstood me. I, I'm, I'm just interested in terms of how do you bring it Yes, well, I, I was going to get to that. The, so we need, uh, and at the top level, and I know we have governance structures outside of the MRP that are governance boards. We are having that reviewed at the moment in the context of ensuring that we're not duplicating effort in that space, that we might be more efficient in the, that area. Uh, we, like, there isn't, uh, every week uh, at our executive, we do have these issues on our, uh, on our agenda at a high level. But it must be clear that uh, my line of sight should go all the way to every one of those initiatives and I shouldn't lose any sight of any of those at any given time. I, I think that we're in a space that is doing that for us, uh, it, it, but it needs to be made more efficient, I would say. Uh, and, and, and when I say that, I'm talking about ensuring that those people who are tasked with certain elements of that project, that they understand their role and function in that project. And, the so, fact, and yes. that the fact they can interact with various other, yes. with various yes. other rec yeah. recommendations. Um, I know that, um, I think you, you proposed um, ensuring that there's going to be monthly, monthly reports on, yes. uh, on, on the uh, progress on the recommendations right. yes. and there, can we anticipate those or have they? You may anticipate, anticipate those, uh, so? John is taking over that piece of work. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll be using the facilities, we'll, we'll project manage it like all other projects and make sure that all of those recommendations are reported on in a timely manner. Thank you. Can, can I move um, speedily on to the whole area of data quality? Some of my colleagues will already have made reference to it, and indeed you did, you did too, um, both in the course of your opening, uh, your opening comments and in response to some of the questions, questions that, were, that were posed. The key element for the authority is um, what's, what's reflected in the Crow Howard report is in relation to that casual attitude um, that was reported there in terms, in, in terms of that. It says a key finding in this review is that these technical and functional matters were compounded by a culture within the organisation that did not recognise the importance of accurate recording. Now, the main response from what I, I can understand from, from your opening remarks is the appointment of the Chief Data Officer. And I'm interested in relation to how you anticipate the appointment of the Chief Data Officer will address what appeared to be an organisational malaise, uh, you know, that, that isn't, isn't confined to one area but, but, but span the entire organisation. What changes do you expect from his appointment or her appointment? Well, again, it's, it's having a high level view of what's happening in that, in that space and offering suggestions as to how we might, as a senior management team, uh, develop those channels that ensure that data uh, quality is at the forefront of everything we do uh, and that the, the, not, 
that people understand uh, why data is being collected in the first place uh, so that they know what the end game is in the context of that small piece of data that might that a thousand people might be putting on at a given time any given day but when you combine it all together they should see the result of that and what it means so I would hope that we're going to learn from this individual that comes in that we're going to see ways of doing that from the recruit in Templemore right through to my office that we get some indication as to what we could do a bit better to ensure that our, our structures uh, and that the way we manage uh, data, the way we collect data and the way we use it and mind it, because there's lots of statutory um, obligations on us in that space as well, that we're doing all of that uh, to the highest standard uh, and that I, I, there's lots of learning there, Maureen, for us. I, yeah. I can see that we're going to learn a lot in that space. In terms of that, um, my Can I just say something? Yeah. That we talk about data as if we're talking about numbers and figures mm. and letters. Like the information that we hold is about people, it's about incidents, it's about you know, places. And I think that the Chief Data Officer and the organisation as a whole needs to step back and refocus and remember just the importance <coughs> and the value of that. It's not about just the numbers, the statistics, it's about the real impact on people's lives. It's about the way in which Angola Shikon interacts with other public sector bodies and with the community. And that's the, that's the atmosphere that we need to generate within the organisation that steps back and recognises that, that this isn't excuse me, just some abstract thought about data, that it actually has real meaning and real impact. I think that's, that's, the, that's the, the real challenge. That's a good point. That's, that's a very good point. Sorry, Moni, if I could just add to that. This is not about the chief data officer. This is about the organisation, right. of which that is one element. And I think the key, the, 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 all of the elements coming together that are set out in the Commissioner's opening statement, from a policy perspective, from a training perspective, from a behavioural perspective, from ev all of those individual elements coming together will create that, that, that understanding and, and, and that belief and those value-based uh, uh, um, decisions that, that, that we all desire. Joe's absolutely right. Our, the, the data we have is so vast, uh, we need to understand every aspect of the, of the importance of the quality of that. And if we're making the decisions based on that data, if that data isn't accurate, well then we, we know what, the, what happens with the decisions. But uh, I think the importance of what are we going to do about data is uh, implementing every single recommendation that's set out in the Commissioner's opening uh, statement. It's not about an individual. It's about the organisation being led by the Commissioner. So, yeah, Thanks for that I clarification. Sorry. Yeah, just, can, I mean, can you can maybe, maybe I might just continue with the, the, the question, and, and you might, might respond, because what I'm interested in is, is if, the, if, if the Chief Data Officer, if we can have confirmation that he or she will have access to all areas of Angarda Shiakana with a view to ensuring that he or she would be in a position to fulfil the remission of that, of, that uh, of, of, of his or her responsibility. In other words, um, you know, in terms of records or files or data. Yes. No, I, I mean, one of the things you asked about was the individual, but I think, that, I feel that whoever the individual is, the process, it's an important element about bringing together various processes, which up to now I think have been somewhat separate. So bringing three elements together, people, processes, and technology bring them together in order to enhance uh, the, not only the quality of the data, but its application. The people element, which is, and you've kind of alluded to it, the value of the, res uh, the, value of the data, understanding its purpose, understanding its application. The process is applying the data to actually get the value out of it. The technology element, not only about the storage of it, but the ability to process it and to actually get it to the users in a timely manner. For me, it's about trying to bring those governance elements together, which have been up to now separate. So it's not one individual that's going to change it per se, but it's about an individual who can bring together certain kind of arrangements, which would facilitate people in the organization to working together better in order to deliver uh, the information. Sue, but I, I, I don't have time. I have a single minute to, to cover an area that's been a very pressing area for the authority for quite a long time, and that's the issue of civilianization. And we were very perturbed um, at, at our meeting during the week with the um, ODIC and Organisation Development Committee to find that not, not up to that stage or just a couple of weeks ago that there wasn't a single um, um, guard officer being redeployed as a consequence of civilian employment, um, appointments. 
Um, and and this, is a, this is a major concern because it's at the core, at the centre of um, uh, the uh, government approval to, uh, uh, to, to uh, increase uh, the, um, the numbers of uh, uniform guardi and indeed to enhance the whole issue of, of civilianisation. So what I'd be interested in is um, if you could confirm for us um, that the whole need for civilianisation within Guardi that's understood and supported across the organisation and that there's a significant will to ensure that it's going to be put in place. I would ask John to address that from the HR yeah, point of view. Mulling, uh, the question that you asked, the fundamental question about the level of commitment to doing this, uh, is perhaps not demonstrated by the current numbers, but let me say that I think I speak for the Commissioner, for the Deputy, for everybody here present, uh, that there is a clear understanding that uh, the numbers we've put forward in what we're calling the Paul Freney report uh, are real. There are a substantial number, I think you've heard, uh, uh, Dave Gilbride and myself confirm somewhere of the order of 1,200 uh, roles that we see as being amenable to civilianisation across the organisation. Uh, we made a commitment in Q1. 1,500, yeah. Well, 1,500 yeah. in, 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 in the, the global scheme of things. Um, right now, we're working on identification of roles. We're at, you asked the question at the, at the meeting we had two weeks ago, what was the scorecard? and where it stood vis-a-vis -vis the commitment for mm. Q1. And let me say that uh, at this point, which is a fortnight on or thereabouts, uh, we have uh, 15 completed, uh, nine uh, additional starts already agreed with dates, one at the very tail end of vetting, uh, giving us a total of 25, and we have 21 in the process of vetting and bringing us to 46. Uh, that's our current status, but into the back pipe of that, are the flow of civilians that we believe are going to create further opportunities. Uh, the Commissioner has led out in discussions with the Chief mm -hmm. Superintendents. Uh, we have 153 planned uh, in, in and beyond this. That's the six per division kind of number that we talked about in, in rough and general terms. And uh, we are driving ahead with the recruitment to relieve the guards from guest jobs. I think the commitment issue, if anybody wants to pick up on the team, there's probably no greater discussion raging on our side of the table than the criticality of delivering this. And I think winning the credibility uh, that we're behind in delivering upon, and I think each of us would recognise this isn't going as quickly as it should. Uh, Thank you, but it will make a fundamental difference. May I Thank just you. speak to that? Sure. Um, John, um, I'm aware you're hiring yes. civilians and maybe the approval process come, you know, uh, been... Uh, carried out by the, uh, by the authority, so we know that, and we know the pace of that. What we don't know, and which the monthly report, the commissioner's report, does not give us any information. There's two charts that relate to numbers of civilians and redeployment. And the civilian piece is listed, the new civilians. There's no column and no data for redeployment. So for us, the litmus test is not only how many additional civilians you bring in, that in some ways strategically is the easy part. Yes. The change piece, the transformative piece, is the re and the, the whole purpose of, of bringing in more civilians is that a large quantum percentage of those convert to sworn officers being redeployed to policing duties? Well, we gave the bald answer to Moling when he asked the question a fortnight ago, and, and what I've just given you there is the update. We will put in that column. Yeah, uh, we have but, no, but we I guess what I'm saying trial. is that the, 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 the pace of civ civilianization, why good, is not the most material to us. Sure. What's material is the redeployment, and that's the transformative piece, yes. and it has been slow as molasses. Yeah. Point, point taken, and I think now that we actually have a score on the board, yeah. it will be something we can put in a column, because the number isn't going to be zero. And I think the, the, the issue then is delta T, progress over time, which I think, Maureen, all of us are agreed we need to see and demonstrate. I think at this point, to, to your point, Moling, this is about a demonstration rather than a, an articulation of the issue. And do you expect, Commissioner, do you expect um, resistance to redeployment when individual officers or um, off 
officers or, or guards are advised civilian X is coming in in two weeks' time and you're going back to uh, good old Mayo. Well, what I have to say in that regard uh, is the piece of work that we got done during the year, uh, the focus of that piece of work was to identify uh, people who could transfer to the front line if uh, we got skilled help in to replace them, skilled civilians. So that was broken into three tranches of, of, of people. One, ones we call the, the low-hanging fruit piece, essentially just do, don't want to be on indoor duty, but had to come in to do some administrative task. Mm -hmm. We could see those being converted, and they're the people that John is starting to convert now uh, and, and get back out based on getting the civilian help. The next layer of people who, having been asked to do an administrative task, did commit to doing that, changed their life um, is, you know, in relation to uh, their domestic arrangements and all of that. So we need to, we just, it wouldn't be fair on that cohort that we just dumped them out on the basis that the bus is coming in with civilians. It has to be, uh, you know, a negotiated piece. We need to involve our um, associations in that, and we will. Uh, and then there's another cohort who uh, traditionally and historically were doing uh, administrative work uh, but wore a uniform. And we have to look at that job profile and see, is this uh, sustainable into the future? And we may uh, come to a conclusion in that context, no, we can do this job very well with civilians, so we don't need Gardaí in those p p posts. So it's a managed process. We will have some quick wins, early wins, at, uh, but we will need to have a negotiated, because we will get resistance, of course we will. Where people see, uh, have got used to certain ways of working, maybe getting used to a nine to five situation, and then having to go back on a tree relief uh, system, where, where, uh, which means that their domestic arrangements have to change. So we have to show uh, some understanding in that space. Okay. Judith wants yeah. to ask a question, and then Pat will come in next. <laughs> yeah, it's just the point about um, civilianization, I, I hope, uh, and you'll reassure us, doesn't just apply to guards at the front end of the organization. Absolutely not. But it also yeah. refers to sergeants, inspectors, superintendents, chief superintendents. This is already and happening. Uh, yeah. and, uh, we, and this is where I'm afraid we're, we're losing some of the credit we should be getting in this space, in that we are leaving positions that were traditionally filled by, say, a uniform inspector. They're not being filled anymore. We're going to wait and we can find a civilian. So already that conversion is taking place. And it's happening in, 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 our, in headquarters, for example, where across our own offices, we have seen many people that left because they got promoted but were not replaced. Uh, so we need to build that into the, to our side of the balance sheet to show that we have been converting uh, positions as well. And I, I, as I said earlier, when it comes to supervisory piece, we will ensure that we are going to prioritize uh, sergeants in administrative functions uh, that we can get back out of the front line and replace them with civilians. Yeah. And just to finish that, do you anticipate any resistance from police officers who may be supervised, managed, or led by police staff? Well, that's another conversation that needs to happen, I think, in the context of the equivalence and ranks and grades and all the rest of it. Uh, we are at a very early stages in that. Like, in practice, things get on, people can work very well together. Uh, but I think that conversation still needs to be had, and we still need to, we need to engage with the associations in that space. Well, it's critically important to change in culture. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Judith. Thanks, Commissioner. Pat is moving on to another yeah. subject. Yeah. Uh, a few questions on technology, uh, ICT. And uh, I think we all appreciate how complex uh, ICT is. You know, it's complex, it's challenging, it's difficult, it's expensive. And uh, having, having said that, it is incredibly important. It's a key enabler of reform, uh, the reform that you've identified in the EMRP. So my first question is, how would you rate the current ICT capacity within Agartha Shikana? I think there has been resultant from the moratorium an excessive reliance on contractors. If I was to look at that and, and say that we need to refocus and reprioritize around more of our own direct resources, um, I think that's certainly one area from a broader capacity point of view. I think it's fair to say that the general demand on ICT. Um, it's probably higher than it's ever been in the past. 
the, and it's not just about the MOP, just the nature of, of where we are in, in delivering on uh, services to, to the membership at large is, 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 is increasing. To, to that extent, uh, earlier this year, I, I had a conversation with the Executive Director for ICT around where we stood in, in relation to the, the current ICT strategy, and he has undertaken an exercise to review and refresh that strategy, um, and that work is underway. I expect that piece of work to be concluded by the end of the first quarter next year, and, and, and already significant uh, work has been done in that area. I think it's equally important, though, and I know there's been a lot of questions about the state of technology within Gola Shikona. There are, there are limitations in what we have, but if we take our Pulse system as a system on its own, fundamentally the technology that's there is very modern. It's using very modern technologies. Uh, it's well placed and well supported. Uh, and from that perspective, it's, uh, it is delivering well on what it was originally intended to do. Notwithstanding that, there are clearly issues with Pulse that need to be addressed. For example, the front end, what does that look like, the interaction pieces, and I'm sure you've had an opportunity to see parts of that, and it certainly looks very dated, <coughs> and, and I think that's, that's a fair criticism. Equally, its ability to interact in a way that, that will allow it to be used on a more mobile basis is an area that, that needs attention, and we hope to pilot uh, some work in that area over the coming, over the coming weeks and months. But that doesn't mean a fundamental overhaul of the back end, the raw part of the system as a whole. Where I think the biggest challenge for ICT in, in this regard is to recognise and ensure that we don't build silos of data uh, in individual spaces. And that's critically important. So whereas we have a series of initiatives that are underway, the easy piece would be to deal with those in isolation. That's not an acceptable from where I'm sitting, uh, and it's not should not fit into the way in which we go about our, our ICT developments. And that was very much key to my conversation with, with the executive director to make sure that in whatever procurements we're doing for new systems, they're done, in, they're done in a fashion that do not introduce silos, that do not introduce the sorts of data quality questions that we have already raised. Thanks, Joe. Um, I suppose my guess is that while now it's receiving a lot of consideration, that perhaps they didn't get sufficient consideration when the MRP was being developed. And maybe my guess is that, that maybe that's some of the reason that some of the ICT was a restricting factor in achieving some of the objectives in the MRP. Would that be fair? Well, I wasn't around when the MRP was developed, so I'll, I'll take that pass. What I'll say, I think more importantly, is it is absolutely getting the priority that is there today. It is a critical enabler for, for, our, for our technology. To, to give you a flavour of that, in the context of what we've been talking about around the mobility strategy, it's very much about making systems and services available to our members directly on the ground. I think there's been reasonable criticism that some of the focus of the developments have been quite nebulous, not, you know, just not tangible enough. And, and the idea and focus of that mobility project is to allow people to see something real and valuable immediately available to them that will deliver improved services to the community at large. The, the strap plan we've been using is about bringing the Gorda into the community as opposed to commun you know, the community back into the Gorda station. I think that's where we're trying to, to go. And definitely we can do quite a lot of, of work in that space and make a difference, in my opinion, without you know, reinventing the wheel in any way. Okay. Maybe I'll move on to governance because we've touched on it. And uh, I suppose what happens in some organisations is an over-reliance on the ICT team driving it. And of course we know it's not the sole responsibility of the ICT team to drive uh, what's required in an ICT for any organization, particularly in regard to the uh, So I'm interested in the role of management, the role of others, and uh, so wherever when you look at who identifies ICT projects, how are they approved, how are they supervised, how are they procured, are they going to be on time, within budget, and achieving uh, the desired outcomes. And so they're all, so they're all really, really, there's a lot of people in the game, if you like. Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, is there clarity around responsibility, accountability, and authority for all of these areas? So is ICT governance, is it fit for purpose, and is it clear? Does everybody understand it? Um, the, my ICT colleagues have the misfortune of having me as a contrarian who, who uh, will sort of have a view and, and a perspective on that. And 
it starts at that level that, that I have sufficient knowledge and technology to understand what's doable and what's not doable. But that's not enough about me. It's about the proper governance structures you described. We have an ICT governance board who meet to assess developments. And they include external representation, including, for example, the office of the government chief information officer to ensure that the work that we're doing is not being done in isolation to other broader public service initiatives. Mm. On top of that, I think an area where you know I've had I've had a conversation with the executive director is whether there, when we reach points of key strategic change, there would be a value in getting some additional external expertise. I'm not talking about consultants. I'm talking about police experts, for example, who understand the value and role of that. And that's certainly something that 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 we both believe is it would be a value. And it's something that we are reflecting on. And see how that we'll do that to bring a different a different perspective into that space, not directly involved in the day-to-day -day governance issues, but providing an advisory uh, capacity around the key big strategic decisions that are needed. But across the organisation as a whole, as I said, we have an ICT governance forum, and ICT clearly fit, fits in at all of the other governance forums that are there. The reporting lines have com come back through ICT and eventually to my desk and into the, onto the table of the executive, where key decisions are also discussed on a frequent basis. So if matters are, are of concern with regard to time or budget, they'll ultimately land on the door of the three of us, myself and my two colleagues to my left. Well, that's good, because that's, that's yeah. where it should be, yeah. uh, uh, because you're the people who are managing the organisation, and it can't be just with, with, with one person, and also with the senior management team. There's also an awful lot of other players. You have the users. Absolutely. They are the experts. They know what they want. Uh, they are key people in the testing of a new system when you're rolling it out. So I'd be very, very interested in seeing that governance structure and you're good, which is great, you're talking about a new ICT strategy coming out in Q2. Uh, could I suggest to you that you would put a lot of detail into, for your own sake and for our sake to give us comfort, into the governance structures in place for ICT projects? We certainly will. And just to pick up the point you made about user involvement, that's critically important. There's no point in in Joe Nugent or Liam Keir or Kieran Downey developing, for example, the mobility project in isolation to the actual demands of our members. And they have been hugely involved in the development of that pilot that's going to be up and running in, in, Limerick, in, the, in a small test environment yeah. over the coming months. Their input is critical. They know the kinds of things that they would like to use. And we certainly see the involvement of people across the organisation has been critically important in delivering success. And then in your broader question, absolutely, we, we will ensure that's included okay. in the structure statement. And almost there, you have a lot of projects, um, which is great to see, in the, in the policing plan for 2018. You have a lot of ICT projects listed, including a carryover from last year on CAD. And uh, I suppose the question is, uh, will you be able to deliver them within budget? As a science, yes, but, but as I said, I, we will, we, it, it's a matter as part of the reflection of our, and the development of our strategy, it's, it's equally looking at all of those demands and the general capacity and the broader budgetary constraints that we face in the organisation. And there may well have to be some, some tough choices made about reprioritisation in, in the short term, in other words, in 2018, so some material may have to move out. But, but well, it would be useful for us to let us know that in June. Oh, no, course, absolutely, we, will, we certainly will. I uh, think I took comfort from your comments on Pulse. You know, Pulse is very important. Everybody knows about Pulse, the general public. So am I right? Because I thought there were concerns about Pulse. It was quite no, old. I, I think uh, I expressed concerns about Pulse earlier in the year, which led to the reconsideration of the ICT strategy. But to be clear about what my concerns were, they were not about the technology being used. They were more about um, whether it was continuing to be the right element to deliver all of the pieces that, that we want in the organisation. What do I mean by that? It was originally developed as an incident management system. And over years, different components have been added on. And if we looked in, down the road, we're going to develop a new CAD system, a new major investigation management system. What I wanted to do was to ensure that this was being done in a coherent fashion, to pick up the point, not to be developing silos of data. If Pulse becomes the central repository for our data, it should be the central repository for everything. And that we shouldn't be developing inconsistent data being held in, in slightly different silos before. As, as I said, as a technology element, it is absolutely right. We took the opportunity to have a look at what other police services were using in, in, in that space. And that will feature as part of, of our, our strategy development. Yeah, I thought that would be a right thing to do, to look at what the police force are doing, <coughs> because there's an awful lot of, obviously, everybody's investing in technology. You have an awful lot more suppliers yeah. than you had 
when you introduce Pulse. Yes. Uh, so I'm pleased to hear that you are looking at other suppliers and what's happening in other police forces. Yeah, and, and I think to be clear, uh, that, that police input is hugely important. It's not about going to individual technology providers or, or resellers of technology. It's as much about understanding what the business user, in this case, police, police officers actually want to use. That said, I mean, we just be clear too, you know, policing in Ireland is slightly different to policing elsewhere. So, for example, the engagement in the United States um, with police services there, their, their systems stop at the point of almost before the matter is handed over to the criminal justice system. Our system goes slightly further than that. So we're not, they're not exactly the same, and we just need to be aware of that. That said, the general approaches are, are equally right. I know, I accept that, that. But if you get 90% of what you want yes, without exactly. having to develop it yourself, that, that makes sense. Okay, but I'm looking forward to seeing more detail on governance in the ICT strategy, and then to seeing the strategy itself and seeing it aligned with the MRP. Thanks, Pat. Just to sort of conclude on this module of the agenda, clearly the authority is at the stage now of preparing its fourth report to uh, the Minister uh, on our assessment of, of the MRP. So that discussion we've just had will feed into our assessment uh, which, and we'll be considering it at our next um, authority meeting with a view to getting the report to the Minister uh, by the end of the year. So I want to thank you for those, um, for those remarks. I want to just, for information, tell you that at the authority meeting today we approved an additional post that you looked for for a data protection officer um, and just to connect the dots I want to acknowledge Commissioner that in your opening statement when you talked about future disciplinary um, it wasn't just data quality that you also included data breaches and I want to acknowledge that because in the environment we're in anyway but with the GDPR coming it's critically important that as the holder of such significant data that, that you have flagged, and I, I want to acknowledge that, that data breaches are, 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 are a big deal and they're incredibly serious. So I so just want to acknowledge that. I'd now like to move on briefly to the next agenda item, which is about rural crime. And Judith's going to lead on that. Judith. Thanks, Chair. Um, and I, I completely agree with the comments that were made about data actually affecting people and uh, you know, the impact on people as victims of crime is incredibly important. Uh, irrespective of the prevalence of the crime, the impact may be very high. And it's in that context and in the context of the comments that Joe and others have made um, that I want to uh, highlight the recent media reports um, which point to a very high fear of crime in rural communities and in particular within the farming community. Um, and we know that some crimes, regardless of their prevalence, can have a very disproportionate impact on, on fear of crime. And indeed, in some of these instances, there have been repeat victimization in a short space of time, in the space of weeks or, or indeed months. So um, can you please uh, reassure the authority and indeed the public that you're taking these fears seriously and that you have a specific plan of action to deal with them? Okay, Judith, um, if I may, I'll... Uh, uh, take that uh, topic and I will bring in Assistant Commissioner O'Driscoll and, and uh, Gurchant to talk about the, 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 the practice and then the, the analytical piece of it. I suppose at the outset the assurance that I'd like to give is that the issue of rural crime is a real, real concern to Angara Síochána and to provide a quality of life to people in rural communities remains absolutely one of our key objectives. Um, so certainly everything that we can do Victimisation is very, very personal, um, and certainly we're really concerned where, it, where people are, are in fear of crime, and we will work, do everything, everything that we possibly can to provide the reassurance, and we will do that in a number of strands. And, and we will talk about Operation Tor, which we la launched a number of years ago, um, and, and, and what that actually means, and what we do in everyday practice, how we target the criminals who, who travel up and down the country and very targeted, very high profile, sometimes quite violent uh, offences, how the work that we do, how we target those. And there have been very, very significant uh, arrests and people brought before the courts in recent times. And uh, I want to re reassure the public that's going to continue. <coughs> in addition to that investigative piece, uh, the community policing element of it, we, I'd like to talk a bit about that, and also our crime prevention strategy. But to set out at the outset, I'm just going to ask Assistant Commissioner O'Driscoll to talk about Operation Tor, and particularly, particularly about the <coughs> targeting of people at a national level, and also at a rural level, at a local level. 
Okay, well, in terms of Operation Tower, I'm not going to go through the crime statistics because Gershon is the best man to tell you how, <coughs> how successful Tower has been since it commenced, albeit that in recent times uh, the level of burglaries has increased around the country. We launched uh, recently at the end of October the winter, what we call the winter phase of Operation <coughs> Thor, and the reason for that is that not alone in Ireland but internationally, particularly our colleagues in the UK, uh, we all find that burglaries increased by about 21 percent, 21 to 25 percent during the winter months, and so we've tried to put an extra focus on Operation Thor. Uh, the launch of Operation Thor was followed by a national meeting which I chaired. Uh, where there were representatives from all the regions throughout the country. And we discussed the strategies uh, uh, and how we would implement it with a cross-region aspect to it, uh, a particular focus on the regional detective superintendents. Uh, and a follow-on from that is that the regional detective superintendents will meet with me uh, on a number of occasions throughout the following months, uh, or the coming months, uh, including tomorrow. Uh, and we will coordinate activity across uh, the regions. There is uh, if a focus. If I, if I may just interrupt you there, and uh, it is very welcome to hear that Operation Thor is going into the winter phase because we know it has been hugely successful, and you pointed to the reduction in the burglary figures, and yes, there has been a slight increase, but set against the context of a long-term drop, you know, those figures are, are, are welcome. But in the middle of all of that, the media reports have pointed to a concern on the part of the public about uh, not reporting things to the guards because uh, when they do report, perhaps uh, nothing happens or their property isn't recovered. Uh, you know, so there is a sense that notwithstanding all the good proactive work that you're doing, John, and we recognize that, that at the basic community level, people aren't reporting things to you because they don't see the results of, of what's happening. Well, I suppose since the first report issued by the ERSRI in 1979 in relation to crime reporting and this hidden element of crime and the non-reporting, that has always been a problem and there is always that percentage of crime <laughs> that for a variety of reasons isn't reported. So we're presuming that the proportion that isn't uh, reported hasn't increased in any particular way. One would think that because we have Operation Tor in place and people know that we have a particular focus on this type of crime, that in fact they might be more inclined to, to report. But we are encouraging people wherever crime occurs to, to report it. We have uh, different strands to Operation Tor. There's a, the preventative aspect is very important. Uh, and uh, uh, Lee can talk about that to a certain extent because it falls into the community engagement area. There's a very particular focus on detection rates. Uh, there's a focus on uh, recidivism and on repeat victims. And all of these issues have been discussed uh, at the national meeting and will be discussed at the follow-up meetings. Within days of the regional detective superintendents coming together, they identified particular crime gangs. And within, I think, maybe five or six days, one particular crime gang, which involved three generations uh, were, were found, uh, three generations of one family, were found with a considerable amount of property having committed burglaries down the country and, and were stopped uh, in Dublin on what we would allege was the return from a crime spree. Uh, other crime gangs who were engaged in that type of activity have been identified and similar targeting has taken place as we speak. Indeed, a few days, I, I think, um, close to that, others' uh, uh, successful result I spoke about we intervened and shots were fired at, by, at members of the Guard of Chicana uh, when they tackled a particular crime gang around the Port Leash area. Uh, on the day recently where we had some major success dealing with organised crime uh, in relation to the feud that's going on, uh, later that day when I met the people from the Organised Crime Bureau who had dealt with that, they had six police officers with them from Devon and Cornwall uh, and they dealt with they came over here to collect van loads of property that we had recovered here. When we examined it, we believed that it was more likely stolen in the UK than here. So if you look at the Plymouth News website, for example, you'll see all these victims who are very grateful for the activity that we have engaged in in Operation Thor, and where many people have now 
being reunited with their stolen property. And, and that's to be very much welcomed. And of course, that uh, cooperation across um, north, south, and east, west is, a, is very, very important. But you mentioned the uh, community policing aspect of this and, and the outreach into maybe some isolated rural communities. And that's where the community policing framework perhaps becomes even more relevant than before. And notwithstanding all of the undertakings that were made in the modernization and renewal program and in the strategy statement and in this year's policing plan, which talks about the implementation of the community policing framework by the end of this year, we learned in committee uh, at the start of the month that the community policing framework has yet to be um, to, go, to have gone through your governance processes and to be approved. So in the context of our conversation around rural crime, engaging with isolated communities who feel <coughs> isolated, who feel perhaps um, very vulnerable, who aren't reporting crimes uh, to the police, and yet, you know, in, in that context, you don't have a community policing framework. That's a big concern to us as an authority, and we would just like to know what's the status of the framework? How likely is it going to be that it will be published within this reporting year? And how is it going to be implemented, given it's such a vital part of your policing strategy? I might come back to the community policing framework because I certainly there is a community policing going on everywhere in the country as we speak. The community policing framework is talking about improving that and building on the current structure and making sure that there is a more consistent level of community policing. But I certainly there is an extensive amount of community policing going on and there is great work going on throughout the country as we're sitting here. So I, I, I will come back to that. I might ask Archie maybe to come in and just talk about the public attitude survey and how that feeds into maybe some of the issues that you've raised in terms of the quality but of data. Could you just, before you do, could you answer the question, when will the community policing framework be uh, approved and started to be rolled out? Well, we, we, we in the context of, of the framework, there are some final, final issues that we have to iron out with it. It will be discussed tomorrow with the senior leadership team. We expect that it will be approved by the end of the year. We have had discussions uh, as late as yesterday in terms of uh, um, including some of the elements of that into the division of policing model, which will be rolled out uh, early in next year. So there is, there is a lot of work to be done on it. I can't give you an exact time, but I, you certainly will get the, the community policing framework in the next couple of uh, weeks. But I, again, I'd like to stress the community policing framework is about improving what's already in place. There is a lot of great community policing going on as we sit here today. And, and I don't think any member of the authority would disagree with you on that point. There is uh, you know, fabulous work going on in local communities. And it is about enhancing that and empowering staff at the front end to be able to do the job that they, they, they joined the organization to do. But you did undertake yep. to not just develop the framework, but implement it by quarter four of 2017. And we learned in the committee at the start of the month that it hasn't yet you know, been fully developed, let alone implemented. So that's a concern. Um, but you know, not for one minute to deny that there's excellent work going on on the ground by the men and women in your organization. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, so I, I don't want to actually kind of go through the, the crime figures per se. Um, rural crime has risen uh, towards the, the, the latter part of this year uh, in terms of burglaries. And it's right that we do respond uh, as aggressively as we can, and not only to tackle the burglaries, but also to tackle some of the concerns that arise within communities on that. But I have a bit of a, a wider concern, and my wider concern is some of the commentary that has been coming out in terms of rural crime. I've come, I'm absolutely clear that there are communities which have real concerns about that. But if, we, if I look at the evidence, I'm seeing a slightly different picture to some of the commentary. So if we look at the public attitude survey, the advantage of the public attitude survey is do, we do have a rural urban split in it. So we, we can measure people's perceptions based on, on whether they live in rural communities or urban communities. And within that, one of the things that I see is something contrary to the, the debate that's going on now within kind of the, 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 the wider circles. So if we actually ask people about their perceptions of crime, 
within rural communities, their perceptions of public safety. They, they've got a very bad uh, view in terms of Ireland as a whole. They, 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 they actually rate our, uh, crime in Ireland as very serious and, and serious. You know, it's something like 81% uh, of rural uh, people in rural locations say that crime in Ireland is it's a serious problem compared to 72% of people in urban areas. But when you ask them about their own local area, that, that flips around. That absolutely flips around. So in rural areas, only 19% of people say that it's a serious or a very serious problem compared to 26% 26 26 of people in urban areas. And this kind of pattern is repeated when we talk about things such as fear of crime. The fear of crime is actually lower amongst our rural respondents than those in urban areas. Uh, if you look at the fear of victimization, that's lower amongst our rural respondents than our urban respondents. If we look at the impact on the quality of life, that's kind of, the, the people in rural communities are actually more likely to say that crime has a, 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 a smaller impact on their quality of life than those living in urban areas. I absolutely say, I absolutely accept that people in rural areas which have been targeted have concerns, but I also have a concern about the general discourse that actually is kind of in itself perhaps creating uh, additional problems and additional fears, which may not actually be kind of reflective of the evidence that we have. But that's why the strategy needs to have a number of different layers to it. Absolutely. It is the prevention piece, and I know you've recently launched your crime prevention strategy, the, the intelligence piece that you referred to, John, the enforcement and yeah. the, the visible justice being delivered yeah. with people being prosecuted through the courts, and the reassurance piece. Oh, absolutely. And, and you've touched on all of those, but it does need to be joined up. But critical in the middle of all of this, I feel, is the community policing uh, piece, which, which is missing just now. I'm not saying it's not happening at all. It's just that new framework, a 21st century response, a modern policing response to this problem needs to be implemented. So uh, and we, no we, we do give a, a commitment that we'll get that uh, completed. Uh, in the earliest possible opportunity. Operation TOR does include five strands, and all of those strands that you talked about from a prevention, intelligence, uh, all of those, each and every one of those strands are included in it. Um, and that will continue, and again, the assurance that I'd like to provide is, th is that rural crime remains a key priority for Angarda Shirkana. Thank you. Thanks, Judith. Um, Kirchand, just while um, we're on the subject of the public attitude survey, I think we had an understanding that the quarters would be published but I think there's only quarter one published. No. Is quarter two published as well? It's quarter two is published, and um, I'm actually going to talk to the management team tomorrow about quarter three, and okay. we're hoping to get quarter three published shortly. Because it's a very rich source of data, and it does help the commentary and the context for the commentary oh, no. if it's out there. So I wasn't able to find it, but that might be my technical skills. So I bow to your superior. Uh, knowledge that it has actually been published. I have the extracts, obviously, that come in the Commissioner's report, but I was just looking for the, for the, fuller, um, the fuller document. Commissioner, um, we had, um, it's, we've both had a very long day. We started early and you started early, so I don't want to prolong the final item. I'd like to give you an opportunity, because we had asked about the state of readiness of the organisation now that the, the victims um, legislation is enacted. Uh, would you like to just uh, give some assurance to the community about the state of readiness of the Garda Shukona? Because I know you've been preparing in the context of the directive for quite a while, but the act goes a bit further sure. than the directive. So it's really just to give you an opportunity uh, to assure the community that the Garda Shukona are ready to implement the legislation now that it's, now that it's been passed. Yes, uh, Chair. Um, lots of work has happened in this space, uh, and I, I, rather than Having to repeat this, I, John O'Driscoll has, has the detail of it in relation to what has happened, which may give some comfort to people who uh, are looking at this space in the context of our state of readiness for, for the future implementation. Well, I, I'll quickly go through a number of, uh, of issues that we have dealt with, but I suppose it's important to say from the outset that the creation of the Garda National Protective Services mm. Bureau has, is a very important part of all of this because it has oversight. Uh, and, and ensures that all the initiatives are being implemented. But just to run quickly through, for example, in relation to pr provision of information, victim information leaflets uh, have been drafted and are placed on the portal. And the divisional officer, uh, the, the head of bureau at the Garda National Protective Services Bureau, has communicated with all divisional officers uh, to ensure that uh, these victim information leaflets are being given to all victims of crime. The website has been reviewed so as to make sure that it is uh, 
suitable for purpose. Uh, the provision uh, of support in, on, in that area, we have um, Pulse letters have been amended. That, th these are letters that are created by Pulse uh, and issued to victims of crime. They now contain a crime victims details of a crime victims helpline. Uh, in addition to that, we have 28 Garda Victim Services offices established throughout the country, so clearly they are, have a critical role in ensuring uh, at, a, at a local level uh, that appropriate information is given to victims and that victims are generally dealt with in an appropriate manner. And that again is, is monitored from the centre by the Garda National Protective Service. The Pulse uh, individual assessment screen was developed to identify uh, vulnerable victims uh, so that there is a particular focus on, on them. Uh, also, we have uh, divisional protective service uh, units created throughout the country. The first four are in place already, and a minimum of additional four will be in place in 2018 with the target that they will be in all uh, divisions uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I personally expect that we'll exceed the four next year uh, and we will get as many as possible up and running. Uh, and they will uh, ensure a much get a greater range of services provided uh, to victims. In terms of interagency cooperation, a uh, memorandum of, of uh, understanding has been drafted between the Garda Shikon and the Irish Prison Service. Uh, and this is all to do with uh, recidivism and, and ensuring that we have a, uh, whatever information we require to deal appropriately with that category of people. Uh, the Garda Victims Charter has been updated. Uh, Garda Policy for Victims has been uh, developed. A new HQ directives in, in 2016, Headquarter Directives 10 and 11 of 2016. There's a new policy document dealing specifically with uh, domestic violence. Uh, and in addition to that, we have the human trafficking, particularly category of victims there, uh, and specific targets set and actions set in the, the new national action plan in relation to human trafficking. Uh, the human trafficking aspect of the Garda National Protective Services Bureau will ensure that, that uh, those uh, recommendations are being implemented. I then sit uh, uh, along with the senior personnel uh, in, the, in Tusla in ensuring that uh, the victims uh, aspect of Dr. Shanahan's report into Section 12 are dealt with in an appropriate manner, and that has been monitored at that uh, level within both organizations. So a significant amount of work going on in that area as well. Uh, there's no doubt that we will uh, require additional services or additional personnel to ensure that we can properly deliver uh, victim services. And in that regard, I have a business plan with, uh, in my on my desk and it relates primarily to additional civilian personnel uh, being brought into this area to ensure that all that we are expected to do in relation to the victims, uh, to victims will be delivered. Could I just ask Chair, sure. uh, based on what John has just said and in, in, we'll, be, we'll be working very hard to ensure that we uh, develop on all the areas that John has, has t spoken of, but we would ask that victims engage with us. It's important that, uh, you know, the challenge is to ensure that they, they find a way to engage. Uh, and we'll be trying to ensure that, that we're providing them with that. Uh, but that, uh, going back to Judith's earlier point about the non-reporting of crime, we want all victims to engage and to, to tell their story so that we can uh, do whatever we can for them. I think we would, um, we would echo that um, because not reporting and not engaging doesn't, doesn't get anybody anywhere. Um, but then the responsibility when they do engage is to ensure that they get not just a good service, but their rights and entitlements yes. um, um, respected. How, how confident are you, Commissioner, that at, you know, at the level of individual Garda stations and districts, that if a victim walked in at random to anywhere, that, that, that they will be received by a member of the Garda Siakona who understands that they have to give them written acknowledgements, that they're allowed to be accompanied, and, and the various elements that are in the legislation. I'd be very confident, uh, Chair, at this juncture, given the developments that have uh, been put into place uh, uh, from the victims' offices, because one of the things that we made very clear, while we have victims' offices to ensure, that's to ensure 24 hour, like that people have access to a Garda at any given time. The Garda that may be looking after their case doesn't lose responsibility for that victim. They're, they're still central to that victim's uh, um, the processing of whatever uh, uh, complaint that they're making. Uh, however, uh, it just it makes it more um, 
it gives a safety net to that victim because they may not always ring up on that card that's available. So uh, I'd be very confident that given the, the high uh, profile that the victims' offices have, have been received in the divisions, that the, the Gardaí, that all of the Gardaí concerned are well au okay fait with the, the uh, responsibility they have in the context of dealing with, uh, with the individual victims that they come across. Okay. We've previously acknowledged and would like to do it again, I mean, the significant differences and impact of the protective service units and the victims' offices. I think they're, you know, they're a huge step and, and we've, as I say, previously acknowledged and complimented you uh, on those. Just two practical matters that um, again, my information may not be quite up to date, but I ask you to look into. Um, my understanding is that while the material for the website is ready, the website isn't ready, which has impeded that provision of information to victims. And I should also say that victims' organisations have been very complimentary, um, that having, those that have engaged with us of the, um, of the enhanced services. So, so this is a good news story, and I guess I just want you to make sure that it doesn't turn into something less good. Um, the last time I looked that information leaflet wasn't very professional. Again, I could be out of date. So you might, uh, you might want to see now that the Act is passed, which I understand was you know, one of the concerns, uh, whether in fact uh, a professional print run might be, um, might be timely. And if I'm out of date, I apologize. <coughs> I'm, I'm, but the, as I say, the last time I looked, uh, it was kind of printed down a photocopied kind of job. We'll take, we'll, uh, we'll take that away, um, yeah. Chair. Uh, and in relation to the, the website, um, I think there was some technical issue, in, for, uh, but, but uh, I've asked that we have a website as it is. It may not be very uh, easy to, to get around, but it, it, it's, it's, it's something it's that really we It's really important that yes, the information yes, is yes, there. Yeah. Yeah. I have a few closing remarks to make before I do. Any of my colleagues want to add anything? Want to add anything? Okay, just in closing, Commissioner, can I thank you again and, um, for your remarks and your colleagues for your contributions here today. I want to echo, on behalf of the full authority, the points made by Valerie, which were really important, about your recent successes in relation to organised crime. At the end of the day, while we, we, we may um, have different perspectives, um, we have a shared objective that communities are safe, that people are safe, and that uh, criminals are apprehended. So uh, I just want to, to uh, as I say, acknowledge on behalf of the full authority the point Valerie already made. It's an important that we don't lose sight of, of the significant policing work that's going on when we are talking about um, management failures. So that's the first point I'd like to make. The second one is I was taken with your remark earlier, Commissioner, about how your organisation and the members of your organisation sometimes evaluate their own performance in terms of the results in the courtroom. And it's something I think as, a, as an authority we might put on our to think about list for next year to see how do we get a perspective on that performance. If that's one of the pieces that your colleagues value, it's important that we get a perspective uh, and get that into the, into the suite of documents. So we're going to reflect on that when we're thinking about our work programme uh, for next year, how to give due, um, due recognition to that area of performance. And finally, I think on behalf of everybody, I would like to acknowledge your apology that you made to the community, not to us, obviously. Um, I, I, just, I didn't do it earlier, but I do want to close by thanking you for the um, apology by, and, and, and on behalf of the authority to acknowledge um, that we accept it, because it's important that I say that, that there isn't a kind of a hanging view uh, between us uh, I would just underline the points we made earlier in the questions from my colleagues, the points we made to you in, um, in private session, that you know, we will be keeping an, a, a close eye on the performance and the underperformance issues, um, and sins of omission can be worse than sins of commission, and those kind of things are something that we will be keeping very close, in close touch with, and we do encourage you to sharpen your focus, in your, uh, as we did earlier, in relation to the responsibilities of your senior team. So with that, thank you and good evening. We're adjourned.